Hello students, I Sakshi Ganotra welcome you once again to the continued series of the chapter that we were having regarding the classification of elements and periodicity in the properties. So if I am not wrong, in my last class, I winded up the discussion related to the classification of elements. So just to give you a brief idea about what we were doing while we did the classification of elements, we first started with the Doberinier stride, right? So I told you that Doberinier was the first person who gave the classification of elements into the triplet form, right? But then because of some flaws, Doberinier strides were rejected. After the, uh, like after we learned with the Doberinier stride, we finally came on to the second classification, which was Newland law of octaves. Okay, so we started everything related to the Newland law of octaves. Then we started that it was not easy to classify the elements which were having atomic number more than 20 or when D and F block elements started, then this law of octaves was useless, right? Having discussed this much, we moved on to the Lothar Mayer arrangement. So when we were talking about the Lothar Mayer arrangement, we said that he tried to classify the elements according to their physical properties, right? But then remembering the graph, remembering the position of all the elements in the graph was really very difficult. So again, this was also neglected or it was rejected. After this, then there came another person. So that was Mendeleev's periodic table. Now, I told you when Mendeleev gave the periodic table, he gave the periodic table in the terms of like describing it in the terms of atomic masses, right? And he only classified the elements on the basis of the chemical properties that were known. I remember discussing with you what were the problems or what were the good points about the Mendeleev's periodic table. We discussed the merits, we discussed the demerits also, right? And then we moved our discussion on to the another table, which is modern periodic table. So till here we discussed that how the modern periodic table classifies the elements according to their atomic number. Also, we had done the discussion related to what are the groups available, what are the periods available and all that, right? So, till here, I can say that we have started related to the classification of elements. Okay. So, I agree we have already classified all the elements which are known to us in a, the most appropriate way. Now, one thing I'll tell you, you know, when scientists were trying to classify the elements, there were elements with atomic number greater than 100. So, there were elements whose atomic number were greater than 100. So when the atomic number of the elements were found to be greater than 100, then people started another point of naming these elements. And thus we moved on to the nomenclature. So although the classification of elements is done, but there was a small topic left out here which was related to the nomenclature of the elements with atomic number greater than 100. So below atomic number 100, names were already assigned like we already know atomic number 11 is sodium, 12th is magnesium and so on, right? But then the problem was that if the atomic number is greater than 100, then we need to use one particular nomenclature. And according to this particular nomenclature, they said that let us give some specific 
names or some specific num uh, some specific nomenclature to the numbers so we have 0 1 2 3 4 then we have 5 6 7 8 9 okay so first of all 0 will be represented as nil n i l and it will be written with the symbol n So here I'll be representing the symbols and here I'll be representing the names. So 0 was written as nil n. 1 was written as un which is u. Okay. 2 was written as by which is b. Fine. 3 was written as try which is tree. 4 was written as quad which is q okay then 5 was written as pent p 6 was written as hex h 7 was written as sept s 8 was written as oct o and 9 was written as e double n n e Okay, so let me just read out all these things. Un, so we have nil, un, by, tri, quad, pent, hex, sept, oct, n. Okay, now for example, so if there is any particular number, let us say 108. Okay, now we need to represent what is the name of this particular element with atomic number 108. So how will we start? So one for one we have un, we will write un. In the continuation for 0, we have nil. So, un, then we have nil. And then for 8, we have oct. So, this is un, nil, oct. And the, at the end, we will be adding em. So, the atomic number 108 will be written as un, nil, octium. Okay. And how will I be representing it in the periodic table? So, un will give us u. So, for un, I will be writing u. For nil, I will be writing small n. For o, for oct, we will be writing o. So, u and o stands for the, so u and o is a symbol of atomic number 108 with the complete name un, nil, octium. Okay. So, let us just study one another name. Let us say the name is 127. Okay. So, 1 will, stands for, uh, will stand for un. 2 will stand for by, 7 will stand for sept. So the name will be un by septium. Okay. So this, this will be written capital, this will be written small UBS. Okay. And let us do one another, which is 10, let us say, we'll say 105, or let us simply say. 155. Okay, so 155 will stand for un, pent, again pent, and then em. So this is u, p, p, un, pent, pentium. So this is the name of atomic number 155. Okay, so this was the nomenclature of elements with atomic number greater than 100. Now, having discussed this particular thing, I think now I can simply say that the classification of elements is done. So, the name of the chapter, if I ask you to tell me whenever I am teaching you this chapter, I always tell the name of the chapter in be beginning and the name of the chapter is something like classification of elements and periodicity in the properties. So, classification of elements topic is done as of now. We are there on the second thing which is periodicity in the properties. Now, see why we classified the elements uh, like in the form of periodic table because we wanted to make the study of all the elements very easy. 
right so that if i'm studying for one particular element second element it is not required that i have to study for all the elements so that is the reason right we said that if the elements are there belonging to the same group then all of them will have approximately same physical and chemical properties right so now we will be choosing certain properties let us say we will be choosing a few properties the first one may be atomic size we can have another property like ionization potential we will study one another property named electron affinity and maybe one another property like electro negativity okay so we will be studying all these properties we'll first try to understand the meaning of each and every property like what do we mean by electron affinity and then we will study the variation of the property so finally we'll study the variation of property along the period and along the group how in moving to like how in moving down the group the property will change the value of the property will vary or how moving across the period or along the period the property will vary so all these details we will be doing one by one so let's do one thing let me directly start with the very first property as atomic size let me tell you what do we mean by atomic size and how the variation of atomic size takes place in a group or in a period so the topic that i will be writing now is atomic size okay so when i am talking about an atom let us say there is a nucleus in the center of atom and so many electrons are present in the shells so let us say this is the outermost shell okay the outermost shell is also known by the name as valence shell just for your reference i am telling you the shell which is prior to the valence shell so let us say this is nth orbit or nth shell so the orbit which is prior to the nth orbit which is known as n minus 1th orbit this is also known as penultimate shell so the second last shell is also known as penultimate shell now if you talk about this orbit which is n minus second orbit so this orbit is known as anti penultimate shell so this is known as anti penultimate shell fine now listen carefully if i am talking about atomic size the atomic size is basically defined as the distance between or the distance from the center of the nucleus to the outermost electron so if the outermost electron is revolving in the valence shell then we say that the atomic size is basically defined as the distance between the center of the nucleus to the valence electron this is what is known as atomic size okay but then you know considering a particular atom it's really very difficult that first you'll go and find out an atom in the space and then try to figure out what is its size it's really very difficult 
So what we do, instead of simply defining the atomic size as the distance between the nucleus and the outermost electron, so okay, let me write, it is just the distance between the nucleus and So this is the distance between the nucleus and the outermost electron. So rather than just defining the atomic size as the distance between nucleus and the outermost electron, I will be defining the atomic size in the terms of different types of radius. Okay. So very first thing that I'll tell you is a covalent radius. Let us try to understand what is a covalent radius. So let us just consider there is an atom with a radius r a. Okay. If I'm ideally be, uh, like if I'm imagining the ideal situation, let us say it is coming close to the another atom, the same atom with the atomic radius r a again. Fine. So this is what, see, if the atoms were not forming any bond, if the atoms were just like touching each other, no such bond. Let me just remove this word covalent bond. I am just saying atoms only touch each other. Atoms just touch each other. But this touching of atoms, just that they are touching each other, this is an ideal situation. It's a hypothetical situation. It doesn't happen that the boundaries of the atom will just touch each other, okay? But if, let me say, even if it is a hypothetical situation, then what can we say about the bond length? So you can say that ma'am, the bond length can simply be defined as the distance between two atoms A and A. So this is atom A, atom A, the distance between these two atoms is bond length, right? So this can be written as the radius of atom A plus radius of atom A, okay? So the atomic radius, so this is just, we'll be defining our atomic radius. Okay, now if this is just defining the atomic radius, we'll say the distance between AA to be divided by 2 is equal to RA. This is given as the atomic radius. Okay, so it is just defined as one half of the distance between two atoms. Fine. However, if I ask you to talk about, let us say, the exact covalent bond let's say if i'm talking about the so this distance that is daa divided by 2 when the two are just touching each other this word is important i am saying that the two are just touching each other so this is going to give me the atomic radius right however when i say that one atom is overlapping the other atom, right? So some region is there which is actually getting overlapped. So this is the distance again Ra plus this is the distance Ra. Okay, now you say that this is what? So you take half of it. So starting from here till here is actually the covalent radius. Listen to me carefully. So, covalent radius is basically defined as 